Welcome to Women in the Arena podcast, the podcast celebrating women doing extraordinary things in plain sight. I'm your host, Audra Egan, and our mission is to elevate the value, strength, and resilience each woman brings to the world. Without further delay, let's go ahead and start the show. Welcome in, everyone, and thank you so much for joining me again this week. This week, I have quite a treat for all of you. We are going to be visiting with Leora Rusin, and she is an Army veteran, she is an advocate, she is a survivor, and she is a business owner. She founded Rusin Collective, and she uses her expertise and her experience to empower those around her. She is also the recipient of several prestigious awards, including the Women of Influence uh, for 2020 and the Woman of Inspiration. It is both my pleasure and my honor to introduce to you Leora Rusin. Leora, thank you so much for being here and welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here. I am really excited for you to be here because we are going to tackle a topic that we whisper about, we kind of all know what it is, but we don't actually talk about it out loud. And I've mentioned it in passing several times on many of my episodes, but today we're going to hit it head on. And that is imposter syndrome. I know it's a big, scary thing because it sounds like there's something wrong with us, but we're going to tackle that too. So first, let's let's start with what is imposter syndrome? So imposter syndrome can mean a, a lot of different things to different people, but the, the actual definition is uh, feeling that you are less than or that people will see you as a fraud or a failure. For me, imposter syndrome is not being able to own when you're awesome and leaning into those moments in your life where you achieve something really cool and that you deserve the benefits of your hard work. Imposter syndrome can be people thinking they don't belong in a room with other people, especially if you are new to a leadership position and you're in, 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 the, in the room where it happens or at the table where it happens and, and not feeling like you belong and, and just not acknowledging your failures for what they are as learning experiences and, and the periods where you kicked ass and, and you should own it and embrace those moments. So why is that? You're saying all this stuff that of course is resonating with me because I have felt this way. I've spoken to many women that also feel this way, but why is this? Why do we do this to ourselves? I, I mean, I don't understand it. <laughs> it. It's a psychology that a lot of people are trying to understand and a lot of people are trying to understand why it affects women more than it does men. How many times have you been somewhere and you, you have a male colleague and they boast about everything that they do, good or bad? They always, they're, they're just like, I did that and I'm that awesome. Some of them can be perceived as cocky or overconfident, but they, they don't sit on their laurels or feel bad about their failures. They're just like, okay, that didn't work out. What are we going to do next? Whereas women, they just sit and and mull over it and psychoanalyze it. And yet you could probably say it's because women are tapped into their emotional side more than men. But I, for me personally, I can, I can liken it back to how I grew up. So I was in a home that was not a loving home. I grew up in a broken home and there was abuse in my home physical abuse, uh, emotional and mental abuse. And that has stayed with me for most of my life. I grew up in a home where I was told I was worthless, that I wouldn't amount to anything. I was made fun of for my physical features uh, because, you know, I grew up, I got acne really early. I got my lady parts a little early, I guess you could say. (laughs) And I was made fun of and picked on by my family and my friends. And it all culminated when I decided to join the military. So I joined the army and I had to join, uh, I wanted to get out of my home life as quickly as I could. And when I was growing up, I 
immersed myself in school. I got a job very early. I did everything I could to just stay out of my home because I didn't feel safe there. And so as soon as I was legally allowed to join the military, I joined the military, but I was still under 18. So I had to get parental consent to join the army. And I'll, I remember the day like it was just yesterday. I'm in the recruiter's office with my dad and he has to sign this waiver, giving me permission to join. And he looked at the recruiter dead in the face and said, I'm only signing this because I know she's going to fail. And so I held on to that all the way out, like until I joined, until I left for basic training. And I almost did fail. I couldn't do PT. I couldn't do a push up to save my life. I had a hard time with the drill sergeant being in my face all the time. I cried a lot. It, it was a horrible experience. And then one day the drill sergeant took me into her office and actually talked to me human to human, which is not something you would expect drill sergeants to do. They're not supposed to do that. They're supposed to be tough and, and hard and not, and be emotionless and not be that human to human. And she, and she just talked to me and said, what's going on? You know, I think you can do this, but if you don't figure this out, I'm going to have to kick you out. But she talked to me like a human being, which was the first time I had ever really had that experience with an adult. And, and with that, I was able to do what I needed to do to graduate. I ended up graduating with high marks across all areas, maxed out my PT test. And, and it was because someone gave me five minutes of their time and gave me the feeling that I was actually worthy of something good happening in my life. And so f there's lots of people and women, especially who have had those moments when they were growing up and have had those life changing experiences that they hold on to. And then they just continue to think, okay, I'm not worthy of good things, or I'm just going to fail at this thing because I've been told all of my life that I'm, I'm not good at anything. And it, and it's just, it's hard. It's really hard to let go of those moments when they, they're just ingrained in you for so many years. I also think that there's a lot of environmental feedback that is happening too, cultural feedback. Mm -hmm. And I don't just mean your nuclear family, because the things that you're saying resonate with me as well, because I, you know, I grew up in a household with an abusive mother that basically said, nothing you do is ever good enough. And that was the constant feedback of it's not good enough. It's not good enough. You're not achieving enough. In my case, what I did is I went out of my way to be an overachiever. I thought, oh my gosh, if I achieve this, finally, I will be worthy, <laughs> worthy of whatever that is. I don't know what it is. You know, would I be worthy of my mother's love? Would I be worthy of finally being recognized as being good at something. And that never came. So I have carried that with me throughout adulthood. And it's only been recently that I've figured out that, oh, that is a backwards way of thinking. Right. But I say this because I had all these external reinforcements of that same message, meaning you have to be smart and pretty. You have to be both accomplished and thin. You have to placate to your male counterparts, to your male friends, because you need to make them feel important. It's not as important for you to feel important or for you to feel like you belong. It's always about somebody or something else. And I think that that is a cultural thing that mm -hmm. is going on that, that we've been raised in. What I want to know is how do we start to shift that? I have started to notice, at least in our in the younger generation, that women are starting to shift that narrative. But I don't think that that's enough. I think that we need to teach the men in our lives about that shift, too. So what are your thoughts on that? Definitely. And I think it means getting opening more doors for men to be a part of the conversation and to be a part of the narrative. So I'm, I'm very active in a lot of the mortgage industries, women's organizations. So Empower uh, that, that Marsha Davies created for the Mortgage Bankers Association, phenomenal program. Christine Beckwith created 2020 Vision for Success and has the Women with Vision uh, division of that. And these women do everything they can to 
encourage men to attend these events so they can be in the room when we have these difficult conversations, when we talk about what it's like to be a woman in a heavily dominated male industry and what it feels like to get a seat at the table but still be overtalked by men and to be told to be quiet at the table. It, it, the feeling that we gave you a seat at the table, so shouldn't you be happy? Men need to hear this. They need to understand that it, it's hard enough to get the seat at the table. Give us an opportunity to show you why we earned this seat and why we deserve to be in this seat. And, and not just that, other women need to understand that we need to support each other. I can't tell you how many times it's I've had a more difficult time having a female leader than a male leader because women feel like, well, there's only so many seats and I can't let another woman take it. So I'm going to step on them to get to the top when it doesn't need to be that way. And these are conversations that nobody wants to have, but we need to have them. And, you know, and I have acknowledged and recognized that there's that type of attitude as well. However, I disagree because I think that if you have a woman at the table, it doesn't mean that you have taken up someone else's spot. Mm -hmm. It means that you have created an opportunity to create another one. As a matter of fact, it's not just an opportunity. It is your responsibility to create room for someone else to come along with you. As I've said it many times, rising tide floats all boats. So it's not a win for me is a loss for you. A win for me is also a win for you. That's just a, that's all part of the weird dynamic of imposter syndrome because you're sitting there at the, the, you're sitting there at the table and somebody somewhere along the way has convinced you or the culture or the environment or whatever, whatever situation you're in that there's only room for one. And I think that that continues to perpetuate this idea of unworthiness or I'm not, I'm here, but I'm not really here. I'm here. Mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm a, I'm a token, but I'm not really contributing that kind of, of thought process, which is all wrong, but I want to combat that. I want to, cause that's at the heart of it of first of all, recognizing that win for you is a win for everybody else. And number, and like I said before, number two, educating the men around you, because I have had many conversations with men as well. And by the way, we have a, a pretty large male audience that listens to this show because they're intrigued, they're interested, and they desire to know more, to change so they can support their female colleagues, the, the women in their lives. I've had questions directly to me that said, what can I do? And I want to pose that to you to have an right now have that open dialogue dialogue with our male listeners that are asking, what can I do to help change this, to help shape this? Because more voices in the room mean that we could be possibly more effective in right. every situation. You know, and a lot of it is, I think it's subconscious where, you know, you're, it, it's just ingrained to talk over somebody. And, and it's not just men that do this. Women do it as well. Everybody does it. It's, you know, you're getting ready to respond to somebody. So you're listening with the intent to respond instead of listening with the intent to understand. And that women do it, men do it. And, and it's that subconscious thing where you need to just be more self-aware of how you come across and how you interact with other people in, in those conversations, in those situations. And so just, you know, take the boardroom, for example, if, if someone asks a woman a question, let, let her answer anybody. Don't, don't over talk someone if you weren't the one who was uh, asked the question or was asked to give feedback on something. And give someone else the opportunity to speak. Don't always, you know, you don't always have to be the first one to interject. And a lot of people are like, I'm, I'm guilty of it, hundred percent guilty of it. And something I actively work on is just knowing when it's, you know, my time to provide valuable input. And if I don't have anything valuable to provide, then maybe I shouldn't say anything in the first place. And so to, you know, to the men that are listening in on this podcast, just give the women, give women or anybody an opportunity to speak. And it's not just women, it's, it's 
it's people of color, it's, it's new employees, it's, it's the seasoned employees, everybody should have an opportunity to provide feedback and be a contributing team member. So what's the result of that? When we start making room for other voices, what's the benefit of it? The benefit is, number one, you get to hear it from someone else's point of view. You get to hear a different perspective, and it might actually help you understand something that maybe you didn't quite understand. It, it helps you get rid of preconceived notions about somebody. Uh, it, it, it allows for teamwork and collaboration. It allows for healthy conflict. It, it, it allows for having those those uncomfortable conversation, conversations, especially when you're in, you know, I'm thinking of, I've been in executive teams where it's always the same one or two people that are driving the conversations and everybody just agrees. There's always the majority that agree when you know, deep down, that's not how they feel because as soon as you get out of that conference room, what happens? People are having side conversations. People are talking about what they really wanted to say in the room. And so, giving people that opportunity to have the the safety of knowing I'm going to say something that's on my mind that I feel needs to be discussed and it's not going to come back to me in a negative way. It will encourage those healthy conversations and those conflicts that need to take place so everyone is is on the same page and coming up with ideas that that benefit everybody. And I want to shift the the conversation a, a little bit away from an employee type of situation and into our personal lives because the imposter syndrome follows you in your impo- in, into mm. your personal life as well. It doesn't just turn off when, after you leave work. It doesn't. It, it follows you everywhere. And I want to tell on myself a little bit and tell you about something that I recognized that I did this morning. And I was like, oh my God, I can't believe I did this, but I did it. Because that is sort of, that program is running in the background all the time. You do things automatically without even realizing it. And this is what I did. My daughter's getting married in April. And I had this beautiful idea, and hopefully she's not listening because it's a surprise. So she doesn't, (laughs) it's okay. I don't think she (laughs) listens to my show. It's all right. (laughs) Um, So I had this beautiful idea of, sending out blank recipe cards and building a a recipe catalog for her as a legacy from all of these different people and having everybody write this recipe out whatever it is in their in their own handwriting because there's a lot of thi- there's a lot of things that you can give but what i'm asking for is the gift of a little piece of themselves hmm can, I love that. Can, can you guess what my mistake was? I don't know. I don't know. I only sent it to the women on the list. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. What a dummy. It oh. wasn't until I was literally stuffing these envelopes with the recipe card that I looked down and realized these are only female names. I'm guilty of this too. And I thought, oh, it's that, it's that old programming running in the background that the only thing that we can do is provide recipes. I know that there's a lot of male, uh, really good male cooks out there, Mm -hmm. phenomenal male cooks. And I excluded them. What a dummy that I already assumed that they couldn't do it. Right. So that's also the flip side of imposter syndrome that I I carry with me. And I recognize that the first thing to combat that is knowing that I did it. Yeah. And then certainly correcting it, which is what I'm doing now is I'm correcting it now. But I want to, I want to pose to you, what other ways can we acknowledge and recognize in our own personal lives outside of work in work situations is kind of it, it's a little bit more obvious because it's it's very um it's very dominant meaning that it's it, you can know it when you see it but in our personal lives it's subtle it shows up in really subtle ways so what other ways can we combat the subtleties of our lives that perpetuate that imposter syndrome 
and because we need to evolve. So yes. how do we do it? So I have a 15 year old trans son and he came out as trans up it's been about a year, but we've been going through this journey for a couple of years. We we knew that we knew that our son Pepper was kind of leaning towards this. Uh, it's this is hard for me to talk about because it it's hard for me to acknowledge when I'm not being the supportive person that I need to be for my son. It's I've had situations where we've discussed what it's like for him to go through this journey. And I'm I find myself saying, are, are you sure that this isn't just a phase? Are you sure that this is really what you want to do? Are you sure that you want to have surgery down the road? You know, I'm just because I'm having a maybe I'm having a hard time letting go of the child that was born and and not allowing him to go through this journey and just being the support that I need to be for him as his mother. And I've, I've realized that if I, if I don't make that shift, then he will start to have issues with being comfortable in his own skin and embracing his identity, whatever that might be. And I, I need to be able to just, um, I acknowledge that I do have to grieve the loss of my daughter but acknowledge that I am gaining so much more with my son and, and just as going through that process. And what has helped me is I've had these conversations with him so he can understand this is how I feel. This is what I need to go through to I see. I'm trying not to get emotional when I talk about it because he is the most amazing person on the planet. And he has, he has opened my eyes to how difficult it can be to just be a kid let alone a kid who who's not comfortable in their own skin, who has body dysmorphia, who who feels less than because they're not living their true self. And so um, that that's something that I've had to acknowledge and accept and apologize to my son for. Well, yeah. I, I, deep breath, deep yeah. breath. <laughs> um, that was that that was uh, that was difficult for you to say out loud, uh, especially in uh, in this forum. But I think that you saying that also helps break open that conversation and the idea that imposter syndrome only sits in the workplace, mm -hmm. that it actually is this cultural uh, tape that runs in the background of our minds and is holding us hostage to something that may not serve us. And it, most of yeah. it, it doesn't. There's this, uh, there's always this unconscious bias. You see someone mm -hmm. and you automatically, like you're dressing them up and down the moment you see them, how they're dressed. Um, are they wearing designer stuff? Does that mean that they're very bougie and pompous and feel like they're the best thing since sliced bread because they're carrying a Louis Vuitton or um, they have holes in their pants? Does that mean that they don't care about what they wear or that they're poor? Like it, it, it all boils down to this we, we all have this preconceived notion who people should be based on what they look like or how they talk or where they grew up. And that's really at the, at the core of everything. And we have to, and I think we're making strides, but I still think there's so much more that we can do to just, when you see someone for the first time, give them an opportunity to just allow them to be themselves and, and show you who they are and not just who you think they are. Um, and, and, my husband's going to get upset when I say this, but the one issue him and I have the most is when he's driving and gets frustrated at the drivers. And, and it's like, I try to, I try to be mindful of, well, maybe they're just having a bad day or, you know, you, you can't get mad at people because they drive like crap because you can't change, <laughs> you can't change that. You can't, and it, and it just puts you in a bad place too. So it's, it, it's just like give people grace and, try to understand that everybody is going through their own thing. And if they're having a bad day, maybe your smile changes it for them. Maybe your compliment changes their whole mindset for the day. And maybe, and, and I'm not saying this like it can happen, but maybe you're the one thing that decided for them that maybe today is not the day I take my life. There is something to live for. I do have a purpose. And it's just, it's, I don't know. I, I could talk about it all day. It's just, you know, being kind and giving people grace and an opportunity to, to be themselves without this preconceived idea of who they should be. 
which is what this whole imposter thing syndrome thing is, is because it's trying, you're going into a space where somewhere in the back of your mind is telling you, you don't belong there. You shouldn't be there. Who are you trying to be? Who are you trying to pretend to be? And it's coming from, a lot of it is coming from feedback externally that we have now made as our own. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is that one of the ways to change yourself is to allow other people to have space to become themselves without Mm -hmm. judgment or criticism. Absolutely. And, and (laughs) just, I don't, why is it so hard for some people just to be nice? It's really that simple. I, 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 I don't know. It, just be nice to others. It's it's not. And I do it. I do it myself. Like with with my son. Sometimes I'm really hard on him because he's a good he's a good student. He does what he's supposed to do. Does he gripe when he has to do the chores? Of course, all teenage kids do. And I don't give him the benefit of the doubt sometimes. And and sometimes I I'm hard on him because I know he can be better and do better. But sometimes he's just having a rough day and they need to give him the the space and, and the ability to have a rough day. And the, if that means the litter box doesn't get taken care of today, that's OK. It's not the end of the world um, as much as I think it is. And that's that's part of me. That's part. That's my problem that I need to like deal with. Uh, and so I, but it is a constant struggle. It is a constant thing that you have to be constantly working on because it is so easy just to go back into that. You're in autopilot. Right. And it's that subconscious thing that you're just automatically going to go to. And, and really all it takes is one or two seconds to acknowledge, OK, I'm I'm doing the thing I shouldn't be doing. I'm making assumptions or I'm not granting people grace or time or space. And, and so I, I have to constantly remind myself to, number one, breathe give myself some time and some space and some grace so I can give that to other people. And the more you do it, it's like anything else. It's, it's repetitious. The more you do good things, the more you, you do to be kind to people, the more it'll become second nature for you and the less likely you'll go to that automatic presumptive space. You know, as you were speaking and I was, I was hearing what you were saying, what popped into my mind is, you know, as a female, I know what I want. What I'm curious about, and maybe you have an, an idea on this because of the work that you've done, and, and maybe this is a, a question that we're a broader question that we're posing to the audience. But a, as a woman, we know what we want when we come to the table. I wonder what men want that hmm. they're hiding, that the, that they have been hiding, and they've been behaving in such a way because they think that they're supposed to that that's what they are required to do, or that's what they're built to do. Hmm. I'm one, I, I'm really curious. What is it that I think, and what is it that they really want to be? Any ideas on that? I see a lot of men who, and I see some women do this too, and it's really bad in our industry, in the mortgage and finance industry, is this this idea that if you're not on 24-7, that you will be considered less than. It's the hustle culture. It's the, I have to be working every single day, 12 hours a day, and I constantly have to be on. I can't feel, I can't feel like physically bad. I can't have a bad attitude. I can't have a sad day. I constantly just have to be on and equipped with all of the brilliant ideas. And then after the workday is over, uh, we have to go out to the bar and get drinks. And we have to go to the clubs or go golfing or, or all of those things that, that you are thinking you have to be a part of, to be included, to be a part of that inner circle. Um, and so I think a lot of people would like to just be able to do a good job to come to work and provide meaningful and impactful feedback, but that if they need to have a day, they can have a day and it's not, reflected poorly on them, that they don't have to be switched on 24 seven to be a good employee, to be a valuable employee. And, and I don't know, I'd like to see if, if I'm on track here, I'd love to hear from, from other people and from men and 
those, especially those C-suite men who have, who've been in that role for a long time. Do you feel like you're just constantly on and it, it's exhausting? Cause I know it's exhausting for me when I have to do that. Like I go to a conference and then I'm like useless for a week after I get back because it, it's, oh, yeah. it's like conference after party, after party, 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 conference, conference. And if you don't go to the parties, well, you must not want to network. Like you must not want to be involved if you're not going to the parties. And so I, I, and I, I think that that's my opinion. I think that a lot of men would like to be able to just not have to do all of those things and still feel like they're a valued part of the team. Well, then I'm going to send out this request on behalf of both Leora and I, and it, we get some responses she and I will get back around and we will talk about them again. Maybe we'll do a live or something. Mm -hmm. But here is here is my open call for both men and women. What is it that you really want? If you didn't have to combat this imposter syndrome or behaving in a way that you think you're supposed to or that culture traditionally has told you you should be, what is it that you want? What is it that you would want to do or to be? That's a really interesting conversation that I want to have. Leora, do you you want to have that for sure? Because I know that's in line with your work. Right. Absolutely. I've actually been in that situation and I almost lost my, I almost lost my family. I almost lost my marriage because I was so focused on getting into that inner circle to getting that seat at the table that I was spending more time than I should with colleagues and going to the bars and doing all of the things that, you know, people do in this business after hours, just, just so they can try to get, get through. And I mean, this was a long time ago. This was, you know, this was over 10 years ago, back when I, you know, different life, you know, I was much younger. And, and I, when I realized that I was missing critical moments in my child's life, because my husband was a stay at home dad for the first seven years of my child's life. And so there was definitely a role reversal in our home. And that was difficult for me to go through as well. When I realized that I was putting my job before my family to the, to the point where I almost lost it all, I was like, this is not worth it, but it shouldn't get to that. I shouldn't have to feel like I had to do all of those things to feel valued at my organization. And so I ended up quitting that job because it, my family was more important to me and the money wasn't important at the end of the day, if it meant I was alone and without my family, the people that I love. Being the primary wage earner or the only wage earner is a strange mental game that you put yourself through, especially if you also have that imposter syndrome running in the back of your head because like you I was the only wage earner for a really long time my husband stayed at home with our kids when they were younger because they were he honestly he was the parent they needed when they were younger i i'm the parent that they need as they're older cuz they're 25 and 22 and they they need the coach now mm -hmm. yeah but but then they needed the nurturer and I, I'm telling on myself, but my husband is a much better nurturer than I am because all I want to do is solve the problem. Mm -hmm. Let's solve it. Let's move on. Let's go. We got things to do. Let's go conquer the world, which is not not a great place to be either. <laughs> no. I'm telling you out loud. <laughs> but that was hard. That was really hard because it's a and you use the word role reversal, which is I, I felt, too. But then right there by saying role reversal perpetuates that idea of imposter syndrome mm -hmm. and that you're not really where you're supposed to be, or I'm not really supposed to be the main wage earner or the only wage earner. And he's not really supposed to be the one at home. Right. And that that's wrong. He absolutely was the right parent at that time for them. And I absolutely was doing what I was supposed to do. However, I shouldn't have made as many sacrifices as I did. I should not have. Yeah. And you're rec you're recognizing the same thing. You shouldn't have made as many sacrifices as you did because you can always make more money. You can't make more time. No. And it's not always about the money. I so I, I just recently opened up my own business. I'm going to make a fraction of what I used to make as a as a an executive, and that's for okay. now. For now. For now. 
now. For now. And I, I'm not trying to, what's going to be difficult for me, again, my imposter syndrome is measuring the success of my business by how much money I'm making. And that's not what it's about. I'm, I'm actually doing something that gives me joy and makes me happy. And if I make money on top of that, then it's just gravy. So it's been a, it's been a difficult mental shift for me because I have always been the primary wage earner in the home. And now technically my husband makes more money than me because he actually has a full-time job with regular wages and I don't. Um, so, but I'm, I'm, I'm still contributing to the family and I'm happier now than I've been in a long time. And that that's priceless. I, in my opinion, it, you know, that means more to me than all the money in the world, knowing that I'm still affecting positive change and I'm doing something I love and I'm still helping other people in this business. And I'm not having to sacrifice who I am as a person and what I believe in, in order to do it. And the money, the money will come because I'm that passionate about it and because I am good at what I do. And I'm acknowledging that awesomeness, which is not something I would have done before. I, you know, the, the, the previous version of me would be like, there's so many other people that offer content services in our industry. How am I any different? And it's like, okay, make that mind shift. You are different because you are this, that, and the other, because you can provide this, that, or the other, because you are, I am a rare bird in that I actually know the mortgage industry and I can write. There are very few of me in the, in our business that can do both. And not only that, I have worn many different hats in the business. So I truly understand the end to end of the mortgage uh, life cycle. And so I'm acknowledging that I am awesome. I am going to kick ass at this and that's, and that's going to be great for my family. And it's a huge departure from where I was even two, three years ago. Well, once again, I'm going to tell on myself because this is my passion. What I do here with you and all of my guests and the audience is my passion because I, I feel like even if it's just a little bit, it's making a difference. Although, and you know, I make no money at this. It's, it's none of that for now. For now, I have to keep adding the caveat for now. <laughs> for now. But there are moments like you that I'm like, what am I doing? Is this even making any difference? Hello, is this thing on? Is anybody <laughs> listening? That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then some things happen, and which is worth more than money. And I'm going to share it with you. Because I know that you're in that space of I'm not making money is a, the is it, it, where's the measure of value blah blah blah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to share this with you. I got an email last night from a woman who was a guest on my show. It will and it's going to be published next week, um, and this is going to be in the future. So, so it'll have already happened by the time this by the time this airs, but. She had to have, she had to have the episode reviewed just because, you know, and the person that she had to have it reviewed by sent her some comments al along, you know, some feedback on the episode, which was all very positive, but then she included something specifically directed to me. And I'm going to read you that quote. Sheroes are the ones who fight for change, no matter how small the battle. The real change makers, however, are the ones who amplify these stories and awaken the Shiro that surely exists in all of us. Women like her are going to create our legacy, or shit, maybe they are our legacy. I read this and went, are you sure you're talking about me? <laughs> because, because that imposter syndrome came in. But then it reminded me that, yeah, even the little bit of things that I am doing that you are doing, that are unique to you, that you are showing up in the world, whether you are attaching monetary value to or not, matter. What you do matters. And when you are in line and in flow with what you're supposed to do, everything else will start to fall in line as well. So even though you don't see the financial results today, I'll bet you will soon. Definitely. And I'll bet, I'm willing to bet 
it's going to be more than you ever made in corporate America. So when that imposter syndrome starts to sneak in, tell it to go F itself. (laughs) (laughs) I call it my, I call it my imposter monster. So, um, he, he likes to rent space and I, I don't know why I call it a he, I guess it could be a she, I don't know. Um, but it's like, you're, you're no longer going to rent space in my head for free. So, um, yeah. (laughs) No. So, I mean, and that's, like I said, that's the part of the part of the point of this conversation. And it's a conversation that we've needed to have. Like I said, in the beginning, we've mentioned imposter syndrome in many other episodes and we sort of glaze over it and we kind of nervous chuckle about it, that kind of thing. But this is the first opportunity that we've taken to have something on purpose. And now we have a call to action. We want to know more. We want to hear from you, all of you, male and female. We want to know what you really want, how you really want to show up in the world. And more importantly, how can we help each other get there? Absolutely. How can we help you get there? Leora and I will find a way to have this conversation addressing that results and that responses out loud, whether it be a live on Instagram, maybe a live on LinkedIn, maybe a live on YouTube. I don't know. She and I will find a way to communicate with you directly on your responses, because that is a conversation I want to continue. I know that you do too. And I think it's really important that if people express how they feel, that they get acknowledgement. It's one thing to just If you ask someone how you can help them and they tell you and then you do nothing with it, that's just like the worst thing ever. And and then they'll be less inclined to reach out for help in the future. And that's something else that I think is really important is it takes a lot of courage for someone to even ask for help. And the last thing that you should do if if they're reaching out to you directly because they, they feel like there's something you can give them to help them through whatever it is they need help with you you need to acknowledge that and respond. Even if it's, I, I don't know if I can help you with your specific thing, but I, I'll be here to listen, anything. But just leaving someone on red or not responding in any way, that's just the worst feeling in the world, especially if it took you a lot to even reach out and ask for help in the first place. And so we need to we need to normalize that asking for help is okay. It is not a sign of weakness and, and that it takes, it, it, it takes a lot of strength to ask for help, especially if you are in an, a leadership position where the assumption is that you got all your, uh, you know, your stuff together and that you shouldn't need help. And so I, I, that's, that's a part of the imposter syndrome too is, oh God, if I ask for help, they're going to think I'm f- a failure. They're going to think I'm a fraud. They're going to think I shouldn't have this position or I shouldn't be where I am in my life. And so normalizing that help is okay and that asking for it is okay, I think is a great next step in, in battling the imposter monster. Well, I'm going to steal a quote from our mutual friend, Christine Beckwith, because she is amazing. Yes. <laughs> and she said this, and I think it, it is definitely worth repeating. We are all just faking it. We're all faking it. We don't all have our stuff together. We do not. I don't have my stuff together. I am literally, I am, I am like an inch shy of losing my mind at any <laughs> given time. Yeah. And I, and I'm pretty sure that most people are too, mm-hmm. because there's just a lot going on. I, I just encourage you to give us your response. We are listening and we want to do something about it. That is the most important thing. We're not just going to, we're not just going to go, that's cute. And just take your feedback and, and use it for content. We actually want to do something about it. I don't know what yet. We'll figure it out. We're we're very smart ladies. We'll figure (laughs) it out. And if we can't figure it out, we'll ask other people. (laughs) That's right. We will ask for help because we know, and that, and that's the thing. There's power in numbers, right? We all, like you said, we all have a purpose. We all have a role and we just have to figure out where that is. There's enough There's enough space in this planet for everybody to find their joy and find their value and their purpose. We just have to give each other an opportunity to make it happen and to be there for each other. It's, it just seems so simple. I, it really just seems so simple. It should, it should be, but we're, we're, but we're 
human and we like to make yeah. everything harder. That's true. So <laughs> Laura, Lior, I want to give you an opportunity to allow everybody to know where to reach you. Sure. Uh, you can reach me on LinkedIn. Just look for my name, Leora Rusin, or you can look for my company name, Rusin Creative. Uh, I'm, I'm more active on LinkedIn than I am on other socials. Uh, if, if you want to watch some really stupid TikToks, you can follow me on there too. Uh, I like to torture my cats on there and make fun of myself. Uh, so uh, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I don't do makeup tutorials. I don't do dancing. Um, I just make a lot of fun of myself and torture my cats. So it's a good time. Good time. <laughs> I, you know what? Who doesn't need a little levity? I mean, oh, come 100%. on. Yeah. Who is not guilty of of scrolling through Instagram and watching dog videos? Uh, me. I watch dog videos all the time because they made me they make me chuckle and give me joy. So what the heck? I'll take absolutely. I can get. And, and my husband thinks I'm weird. He's like, you know, you're you're the only one laughing. And I'm like, so. I feel good. That's okay. Yeah, absolutely. If, and and you know that way. If other when other people make fun of me, it's okay because I make fun of myself all the time. No big deal. That's, absolutely. <laughs> I I'm gonna I'm gonna sit back from the mic for just a second because I want to give you just an open mic for a moment to have a direct message to the audience. No one's ever given me an opportunity to do that before. <laughs> what do I say? Okay, well, I will, to the audience, I know a lot of the audience are people that uh, I know in real life or have, uh, I've crossed path with, paths with at some point or another. So to the audience, I just want to say thank you to everyone who's supported me, who's had to put up with me over the last few years. It has not been easy. Uh, and to just let you know that I am here to help you in any way. I will support your business. I will support your nonprofit. I will do whatever I can to be a, a beacon of hope for you, a, a place of light, a place of comfort. Um, and all I ask is that, you know, you pay it forward and be a place of light and comfort for someone else. And don't be afraid to, to say what's on your mind and to share your feelings. Uh, because we need, we need to be able to do that. So that's what I will say to the audience. <laughs> thank you. That was amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know what? You surprised me too, because no one has ever thanked the audience. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Good on you. <laughs> that's, that's wonderful. Uh, <laughs> Leora, Leora, thank you for being here with me today. Thank you for this amazing, riveting conversation, by the way. It's been an hour and that went by in like five minutes, just yeah. in case anybody was keeping track. <laughs> um, I am super excited to see what kind of feedback we get mm. and what we get to do with it. Yes. I mean, that's the exciting part is we have no clue. And that's what makes this so fun. Absolutely. So, thank you for being here with me. Thank you for taking this risk with me because who knows what will happen. Oh, boy. And <laughs> I know. I, and I want to thank all of you for listening. And I'm going to thank you ahead of time for being brave enough to give us some feedback so we can do something with it. So Definitely. thank you for being here. Thank you for your time. And thank you for your participation because we really appreciate it. And thank, thank you, you for you having again. me. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's been a blast. <laughs> thank you. And thank all of you. And we'll see you again next time. This is just the beginning. that's our show. I am so grateful for each and every one of you and your unwavering support and your continued belief in this movement that has become much bigger than me, much bigger than just a podcast. It has become this forward momentum that we are all doing together. If you are ready or you know somebody that is, that is ready to tell your story and share your value with the world, please connect with me. You can reach me at audra at womeninthearena.net. I am so honored and thankful that you will share your story with me and I'll make sure that it is well taken care of. I will never stop thanking each and every one of you and I cannot wait to talk to you again next week as we share another woman's story and we celebrate her doing extraordinary things in plain sight. We'll see you next time. This is just the beginning.